it's my great pleasure to introduce her and Wenal today. And I'm going to read just a little something from Jan's website. I think that, that is beautifully written and explains what her work is all about. And it says, welcome. You may be reading this because you are curious about fresh ways of understanding trauma and addiction. There is, in fact, a better way to understand trauma addiction, a way that honors the wisdom of the body while integrating the latest findings in neuroscience, a way that creates a new social movement of liberation away from being shamed and pathologized just for responding in ways that have not been appropriately understood, a way where we can respectfully understand addiction and treat trauma responses with deep embodied listening. And that was written by Jan and it's a beautiful piece there. So all I'd like to say is I'm very grateful for people like Jan and for the tireless effort that she's put into her work, uh, all to come up with ways to understand and treat trauma and addiction and help us all in recovery. Jan's new book, Treating Trauma and Addiction with a Felt Cells felt sense polyvagal model offers groundbreaking insights taken from Jan's more than 40 years of work in the field of helping people heal from trauma and addiction. Thank you, Jan, for all you do. And uh, now I'll turn it over to you. Are you able to unmute yes, there? Yes, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Thank you so much, Patrick. I, that was lovely that you read that piece. I had forgotten that I wrote that. So we're going to go on a journey over the next 90 minutes and um, really important to invite us all to find a way to be able to really feel into and to think about addiction in a fresh way. So I brought together two different models um, to create a way of working with addiction that is really a paradigm shift. Um, do you want me to spotlight myself so people can see me? It's kind of nice, I think. Is that better? So these two different ways are through the felt sense, through Eugene Gendlin's work called Focusing, and through Steve Porges work and Deb Dana in uh, polyvagal theory. So we're gonna go through, I'll share um, some PowerPoints around uh, the model and how I, I'll really tell you my story of how I developed it over uh, just over 40 years of practice now. But as we start to go into it, you know, so important in life to set the stage, right? To, to set a way in which we can be together and explore new ways um, that help to be able to suspend things that we already know and invite new ways of knowing. So step one in focusing practice, Jenlin's practice, he called clearing space. And this is a, a beautiful practice to be able to quiet the mind and clear the mind and the body to be able to approach something in a way that allows us to be really curious and to suspend what we already know and think about and feel about addiction or anything. So I want to invite us to do this practice uh, as we start into being together. And, you know, I welcome you to be able to, you know, settle yourself in your chair. We're going to work a lot with the body because that's what this model is all about, right? Addiction happens in the body, profoundly in the body. And yet in so many ways, the, the way that we have built uh, concepts to understand addiction leaves out a lot about the body and body process. So that's what we're going to work with today. So... It may feel okay for you to kind of soften your gaze, maybe even close your eyes, and it may not, right? That could be really scary. So just check and see what feels okay for you as a way of starting. Or you might wanna just soften your gaze and, and look at something around you. 
But what we want to be able to do is slowly check into breath. To slow things down. If it feels safe. And if it doesn't feel safe, that's just fine. Just bring attention to what's around you in the room. And you can stay at this kind of distance with yourself where you feel comfortable. Because going in and checking into the body can be really scary, especially when we're actively in that addictive feedback loop that we're going to talk about. But it might be okay today, in this moment, right in this moment, to just slow things down a little bit. And what I'm inviting you to do is to take everything that you've learned about addiction, all the different ways of understanding it, And there are a number of different ways around. Some people think it's a brain disease. Some people think it's a choice. Some people think it's because you're a bad person. All of these different ways of understanding addiction. And I'd like you to take them and just kind of wrap them up and put them at a distance. Just make a space around them so that there's room for a new way to come in that you can play with. And we'll play with it over the next 90 minutes. So it's a new, fresh way of understanding what happens in addiction. So that can be a challenge (laughs) to take all of those ways that we think about what it is and put it just at the right distance away from us. Well, we're just going to try to do that for now. Now it's like saying that every theory is just a theory and we can prove it wrong. Even this one, even this model. And then I'd like you to take as much as possible in a very tender way, the feelings, the experiences that you have around addiction. And very gently, see if you can put them beside you. Just for now. And then what we're doing here is making a quiet, what Jendlin called cleared space inside so that we can be with how we understand and experience addiction in a really fresh way. To be curious like a little kid. This can be really challenging to do, but it's a wonderful exercise to do with really anything in our lives because it brings us into this wonderful space where we can just welcome what comes. And you might find even that there's a word or an image or something that helps you to remember this cleared space inside. And you might even notice if you feel into your body, what it feels like in there to have this space in your body. Often it comes somewhere down in the center of the body that feels open and receptive and really curious. It's 
Sometimes if we really listen quietly, the body gives us a beautiful image or a word or something that we feel in our chest or down in the belly. This nice cleared space inside. And you might want to just make a little note of that for yourself. So you got it there. You know what it is. It's also just a beautiful grounding practice. When you feel overwhelmed or as Patrick and I were sharing before, this beautiful halt notion of hungry, angry, lonely, tired, just to pause. So we do a lot of pausing in embodied work to listen to the body and use this as a kind of, what we would say in polyvagal language, a ventral practice to come back to, to ground and to clear and to be really open and even excited about being with something so tender as addiction in a really fresh and new way. So we were just in this beautiful place of clearing space inside and welcoming something new to come. And the primacy of human presence. So traditionally we have viewed addiction as being um, a brain disease. Um, something that's with us forever um, and that we have to be vigilant about basically forever in that kind of model. But this model of working with the body and working with polyvagal theory shifts the way that we understand addictions to make them, um, the function of them to be part of what happens in the autonomic nervous system. So we're gonna get into this as we go along, but the idea that I really want you to get now is that it's so important to be able to be open to shifting paradigms in how we understand what's happening in the body. And we're shifting from a kind of pathologizing lens of understanding addiction as as a brain disease into understanding addictions as ways of regulating different states in the nervous system. And to that extent, through the body, we see them actually as very adaptive because when we're in traumatic environments and we don't have enough safety, the body needs and is designed to be able to create ways to keep us uh, coping inside to survive without when we don't have enough options to be able to really create safety in in our lives. So in this sense, when we move into the body, we begin to understand that the body is so beautifully designed to be able to, in many ways, often numb us to be able to cope. The problem is, of course, that we get stuck in those neural pathways. And so we're going to look at that. So it's a new definition of addiction, a simple definition. It helps you in the short term. It hurts you in the long term. And you can't stop doing it. A very simple way of understanding. Very close, I think, to Gabor Mate's definition of addiction, as we've talked about together. So the work for me is a real call to action. And I think it is for for lots of us. Um, You know, as we were saying just before we started with Patrick, um, you know, there's, there's just, it's, it's a terrible time in terms of the rates of addiction that are happening in the world. And those of us doing this work are really, we're really compelled to dig in and try to find a variety of different ways of understanding and also being able to treat addiction because different pathways help different people. So in this model, where we, where we come into the body process, 
we look at three different ways of being able to do that. So one of those ways is developing our capacity to be in our bodies and to feel safe and comfortable in our bodies. Because part of what happens in addiction is that we move out of the body because being inside and connected has become a really unsafe, scary, frightening, violent, wounded place. So finding our way back to feeling comfortable inside is a major part of the, of the process of working with addiction through the body and through polyvagal theory. We're also looking at developing our own personal narrative. You know, what happened in the, what's the story, right? And we talk a lot about that in, in AA models and in other models and trauma models. What's the story? Where did it begin? And how does it play out over time? And then we also have worked a lot on developing daily practices, uh, embodied practices. And these practices are wonderful ways of being able to um, access grounded ventral states in the nervous system. So there's two body processes that I work with in the model. One of them is called neuroception. This is a polyvagal term. And Steve created this word, Steve Porges, that really means this part of ourselves, this unconscious, autonomic part of ourselves that watches out for our safety. And when we work with the autonomic nervous system, that's really what we're working with is what creates safety in the, in the body and how do we keep ourselves safe in every moment by moment experience that's happening. So this is the process of what he calls neuroception. And right now we're all doing that at the same, you know, the same time where am I safe? Am I not safe? And how do I help myself to feel more safe? So slowly in my body, as we work through, you know, whatever comes up with technical things or whatever, and in, in being a pre presenting a, a workshop, it's just, helping the body to settle down more and more and more and to feel more and more grounded that we would all go through as we're working through uh, the workshop, right? How, what is this and how does it figure into how I live in my body? How do I keep myself safe? And in the addictive state, of course, the way that we're attempting to stay safe is through trying to regulate these really uncomfortable uh, states in the body of either overwhelming feelings or deadening and numbing feelings. And the other process that um, I work with in the model is, called, is a, an introceptive process. And this is like a mindfulness process. For me, I came to focusing and felt sense work um, over 30 years ago uh, as a way of trying to connect inside and work with grounding, and also to work with issues in your life, to notice how does the body carry issues that you have in your life, because our bodies give us a lot of information about what we need, if we listen to them. And in so many ways, we've lost this in our culture, this capacity to really listen deeply and to live in the body. <clears throat> in North American Western culture, we really divorce ourselves a lot from body. So this is really the heart of the embodied model of working with addiction through these two processes. Um, some of you may be therapists, some of you may be coaches. Often there's an overlap. We know we're drawn to this work when we've struggled with it ourselves. Um, I always make a point of really... Um, talking about how important I think it is as trauma therapists to understand that we probably are working with addictions because when we're working with trauma, we're working with dysregulated states in the body of either too much overwhelming flight fight feelings in sympathetic or shutting down and dissociating. And so, you know, I think over the years, what I've seen in 40 years of doing the work is that there's been this big split between those that work with addiction and those that work with trauma. 
And that split is now becoming more and more integrated. Um, and I think that's a, a really important and, and good thing that's happening. Um, but it wasn't always like that at all. So my journey started um, fresh out of graduate school. I was working with a young group of women who were incest survivors. And I start my book with a description of this group. This is really how I got into the work because these women were obviously incredibly traumatized and they were sharing with me these um, really horrific and very confusing ways for me of um, being able to cope with, with these overwhelming feelings. So they were doing things like um, cutting the body, uh, drinking huge amounts of alcohol or doing a lot of drugs, engaging in really unsafe sex, um, even things like eating bars of soap, um, eating huge quantities of food or restricting food. And back then, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't talk about these behaviors as addictions because we didn't talk about behavioral addictions. But what I saw was that these behaviors were what we were described as, as, uh, as self-harming and self-destructive. But there was some way in which they were helping these women to survive. And uh, we didn't really understand that in the beginning. How could you be cutting the body and it helps you to survive? And over time, I began to really understand more and more about how Indeed, that really does work because it actually release, releases endogenous opioids, which, which numb the body. But in this environment that I was in, um, in a psychiatric ward of a hospital, these women were, were really pathologized. They were frankly treated with contempt. Um, they were often uh, diagnosed as having borderline personality disorder, and they were dismissed. And that just didn't sit well with me because I grew to really enjoy them. And over the years, uh, love some of them. I still know a few of them. Um, and we did amazing work together because I knew, somehow I knew that the important thing was to listen to what was happening for them and to not buy into the psychiatric pathologizing model that was around me. So that's how it, it kind of started, was really befriending, uh, although I wasn't their friend, um, these young women, and trying to help them be curious about what these behaviors were, how they were functioning for them. And really, it's, it's been a journey to understand and have this all kind of unfold over time. So in those early days, it was really the feminist therapists who um, were also actively listening and trying to be with uh, other women in non-pathologizing ways. And I started reading, I read a beautiful book by uh, Laura Davis and Ellen Bass called The Courage to Heal, where they talked about, you know, these, these problems that survivors were experiencing with their bodies splitting and numbing and addictions that they began as attempts to survive. And that's what I saw. I saw that they were adaptive responses because somehow in their bodies, as they described this process, they knew in an embodied way that it brought relief. And back then we called this flooding and numbing and we didn't know that this was the, the autonomic nervous system, although Judith Herman knew uh, in her book, Trauma and Recovery, which I would highly recommend you read. She does talk about the autonomic nervous system and she talks about how jolts to the body, severe jolts to the body bring a kind of numbing dissociation. Well, that's polyvagal theory that we shall see. And that's why I was so excited when I discovered Steve Porges' work. 
So we also then bring in this anti-oppressive lens of understanding that this kind of cultural trauma that exists um, through racism and misogyny, poverty is a huge one. And the area that the, these young women were, were living in was a really uh, tough area, hard, hard to be in this environment. And we see how trauma impacts addiction. Um, it's, it's really undeniable at this point. And certainly, you know, Gabor Mate has done a tremendous amount in helping us to, to really bring that into our way of understanding how addiction is fed by uh, trauma, by emotional and physical dysregulation in the body. This was the first model that I came up with. Um, it was a long time ago. And you can see this big um, sort of red orange ball. This was what I could see in, in, uh, in the sympathetic branch of the nervous system, although I didn't think of it like that back then like that. We just called it flooding. And um, the other end of it was this kind of numbing dissociated place. This is the branch of the nervous system that Steve Porges uh, named, right? He, he, he found this and we'll, we'll get to this uh, in a bit. But I didn't know that back then. I just knew that we called this flooding and numbing. And I was trying to hold this space in the middle to help my clients find some way of regulating between these two incredibly uncomfortable places. And these, of course, are the places that uh, are part of this trauma feedback loop that the body gets stuck in. So I went looking for how am I going to help these women? I mean, clearly, there's all this stuff going on in their bodies. But there was no therapy that talked about working in the body that I could find and train in that was close to me in Toronto. And then I did discover um, through lots of workshops that started to happen, um, some work that was done by this person called Eugene Gendlin called focusing and working with the felt sense. And I was uh, lucky enough to find Mary Armstrong, who uh, was a focusing oriented and trauma therapist in Toronto. And I trained with her and I learned how to be able to bring people back into the body when it has been such a scary place to inhabit because of such deep wounding. And of course, addictions keep us out of that space to protect us. So here we see there's six steps in focusing that Gendlin discovered focusing practice really through research that was done through listening to tapes and hearing these spaces in the tapes of the recordings of therapy that, that there were big pauses, like kind of like we did at the very beginning where these pauses where we allow ourselves to go inside. And so he made six steps as a way of helping people to come into the body in a safe way over time. And the first step he called clearing space, which was one of the practices that we, we did at the very beginning of being together. And then we go through into finding a felt sense in the body of getting a handle for that felt sense, you know, a word or a phrase. We did that also at the end, you know, when you find this lovely cleared space where you can just be curious without judgment or evaluation or thoughts getting in the way. And then is there a, a word or an image or a a felt sense, a feeling, a physical sensation in the body that helps you to kind of find a, a handle as a way of being able to get back and resource this place again. And then we often focus in partnerships. So we would have our focusing partner. In some ways, you know, there, there's the partnership with sponsors in, in AA. And here we, we partner as well, but it's more of a peer model. And so our partner would listen to this process that we're going through about a particular issue in our life, something that comes that we want to pay attention to and tap into that wisdom in the body. And the partner would resonate and say back what we're sharing. Then we might ask a couple of questions about that. And then towards the end, we're really welcoming all that came in that experience, because it's so rich 
to just quiet everything down and go inside. And sometimes that's all it needs is somebody holding space with you, being curious with a problem in your life, and something starts to move and shift in the body. So listening deeply into the body, as we did in the beginning, this is very much a process of uh, working with addictions through connecting in deeply inside and shifting away from seeing that this is a kind of medical or brain disease process in the body, but more that it comes from this autonomic nervous system that is constantly watching to see, are we safe or not safe? And then using behaviors or substances to shift us from one of those places to the other in an attempt to try to cope. So a simple example of that would be, um, you come home and you're in that flooded flight fight sympathetic branch of the nervous system, anxious or angry, you drink a bottle or two of wine, and it shuts, shuts us down into the numbing dorsal state, or vice versa. So cutting is one of those things that can take us back and forth. Cutting can also activate the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. So through a polyvagal lens, we see addictions as what Steve calls state regulation strategies, or I call propellers. So Jenlin created this experiencing scale as a way of being able to really assess how deeply can you go down into the body. Now, this is mostly used for therapists, but I actually find I, I share it with clients in my groups and they like it because it helps you to be able to track where you are in terms of your capacity to touch deeply inside into really the essence of who we are. So uh, <clears throat> Jen Lin was um, a student of Carl Rogers, who was a very famous uh, psychologist in the States. And they both noticed these moments of movement in the body. They were experiential therapists and, you know, very different, right, to the, tra the traditional cognitive behavioral models that we use now. Um, these are experiential models. Their process models, more than co content's important, of course, but we look at embodied process. This is really our home in understanding uh, how um, trauma and addictions work because they happen in the body and we've forgotten so much about this. So they noticed that there was this physical release. There's like a, a felt, we call it a felt shift that occurs in the body when you stay with something, and especially if you have a, a compassionate kind of companion with you, and you give it this kind of curiosity that we started with, no judgment. Like, why, what is that that led me to behaving in that way that I would never normally behave? Where I ended up hurting somebody else or myself and I shamed myself. What is that all about for me? And we would go into the body around that. And sometimes when we stay with that, some kind of knowing comes there and some kind of compassion or forgiveness comes there in that moment. And there's a release, there's a physical release and we feel better. We feel better in the body. And that's the body's natural way of shifting and releasing and helping us to carry forward in a healing pathway. So we call this the felt shift. And what I discovered for my, myself in this journey was that that felt shift that we feel when we're accompanied in this really caring way of exploring what's going on for us and suspending judgment. That shift in the body is a neurophysiological shift in the nervous system from a sympathetic flight fight place down into a calm ventral place or from a dissociated numbing place into 
a more uh, alive place of growth and, um, and health. This was the second model that I came up with. Uh, and this model is informed by interpersonal neurobiology. So it started to make a little more sense in terms of what Dan Siegel talked about with this chaos was like the sympathetic branch of the nervous system and what he called rigidity, which is more like the dissociative numbing branch of the nervous system. And then I started to put together, okay, so addictions are in between these two states and they bring these shifts in the body for sure, right? If you are using enough, you will, you will have some kind of a shift in the body, either to shutting down or activating. Um, but it isn't a shift that is alive and grounded and ventral and carries us forward into growth and health. Um, so Siegel was a, a, a big one in working with um, the model of integration. And he also, in, in his model, he also moves away from the diagnostic and statistical manual, away from the pathologizing way of understanding addiction, and really seeing addiction more in terms of, the, of emotion regulation and how that relates to the autonomic nervous system. So there's a lot of overlap between Dan Siegel's work in interpersonal neurobiology and Steve Porges' work. And if you don't know Dan Siegel's work, it's really uh, worth checking out. He has lots of um, trainings and whatever, wonderful, wonderful work. He, he also has in his model, it's top down because it's neuroscience based, but it's also very bottom up. And that is very similar to polyvagal theory. He developed mindfulness practices as well which work with the felt sense in the body. And then of course, Siegel is famous for his work with attachment styles. I'm not gonna go into this too much, um, but it's very, it's really very powerful work and very, uh, you know, informs trauma uh, therapy so much. So the, um, the secure attachment is that place in the ventral branch of the vagus above the diaphragm, this vagus nerve, right, is the 10th the cranial nerve in the body, the longest nerve. And it carries all this information that's attached to all of these organs in the body up to the brainstem. And from there, this process of neuroception decides whether we're safe or we're not safe, but it's unconscious. So if we're really lucky, we are born into family and community where we have this kind of secure attachment and what I call a, a safe nest. And in this place, addictions don't happen because from a polyvagal perspective, we don't, we are not shifting back and forth from the sympathetic branch to the dorsal branch. Uh, we're, we're, in those states in the nervous system when we need them, if there's a loud noise or we need or something is a threat and we need to run, that happens for sure. But if the majority of the time, the place where we grow and develop um, is safe, we don't develop addictions there because they're just not needed. Then there are of course, um, insecure uh, attachments which, which happen uh, and the, the, the first one is that kind of avoidant um, parent or, or caregiver or community where there's, there's just too much distance in the way that, uh, that the baby is being held and it feels unsafe. Or there's this ambivalence where there's too much distance and then there's maybe even too much closeness. So you're either kind of held too tight or pushed away and you never really know which is going to come when. That unpredictable kind of attachment is, is hard. Um, where we see um, addictions the, in, in the really severe ways is with a disorganized attachment. And this is where our caregiver, our community is, is either really terrifying, we're in a, an abusive situation, or the person who's caring for us is terrified. And so they're in this numbing, dissociated state and they're not available. So when this happens for us growing up, it of course shapes 
how our whole physiology develops and our brain chemistry as well. Okay. We use body cards when we work with um, the model. And you can see here's an example of the ventral, we call it flock in the nervous system. This is the grounded place in the body, the place of health and growth. And it's inter interesting to see that um, in people that have filled out the body cards, almost uh, pretty well every card has some form of a kind of yellow in it. Um, yellow seems to be a color that really brings forth a sense of grounding and, and healing. And we, we have a way of being able to describe what's happening in the body, in the felt sense in the body, through memories that the body carries, through thoughts and physical sensations in the body and feelings. This is an example of the sympathetic branch of the nervous system in flight fight and what that looks like uh, in the body. You can see it's very, really powerful um, the body cards as a way of really documenting your journey. You know, this is what happens for me in this state that I live in. And this is what it looks like. And then you can come back to this and remember these experiences and then also use the grounding flock body cards as resources to find your way back to a grounded place. And this is the numbing, um, dissociated body card. Very powerful. So there's five different theories in the model. Um, the feminist trauma-informed theory, the focusing uh, model. Jenlin was actually a philosopher. It's a very deep work, <laughs> interpersonal neurobiology. And then um, I integrated uh, Mark Lewis's learning model of addiction. Um, we'll just briefly touch on that and polyvagal theory. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with Mark Lewis's work. He's a, a lovely guy. He's a friend. He lives in Toronto too. We just had dinner. And I thought, well, if I'm, if the disease model doesn't fit with this way of understanding addictions through the nervous system as state regulation strategies, which are indeed adaptive, so in, in, we understand these as adaptive features that the environment is maladaptive, not the person. Um, then how, what is another way of explaining addiction? And I found Mark's work and Mark's work really reflects so much of what we've learned about neuroplasticity over since the decade of the brain in the 1990s. And he describes um, addictions as very bad habits. So he sees this as these, these pathways that develop in the brain that we walk down over and over and over again in an addictive trauma feedback loop. And the good news is that we can change those pathways. That with what Steve Porges calls neural exercises, which are mindfulness practices, focusing practices, um, other things like playing the piano, things that bring us into social contact with each other. This is, this is a, a neural exercise, what we're doing here in sharing together in the group in this um, uh, way of, of engaging with each other. That these ways of being together in aliveness and alertness and presence actually develop these new neural pathways in the brain. And if we practice these, these exercises, particularly daily practices, so every day, um, we can really move out of that scary place of being afraid of this part of ourselves. And he describes um, in The Biology of Desire uh, how a, a very kind of clear way of understanding these different parts of the brain and how they're involved in addiction Really important that, you know, this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, what he calls the bridge of the ship. So this is the adult part of the self, the, the part of us that is the, that I'm in right now in being here with you and doing this presentation um, that thinks through things that is it has the capacity to um, plan um, and to be kind of the very best of ourselves in terms of our value system and whatever. 
And we see that, you know, in that state of addiction, when the brain is just so busy going down those same pathways all the time, the, it really cuts off this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so we end up doing things that we would never normally do because the striatum is so goal focused on getting that thing that's going to bring that dopamine hit. And the bridge of the ship, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is really compromised. So it's not that we are bad people or that we, we are, um, we've lost our kind of morality. It's that we've lost connection with that part of the brain because of the way in which neuroplasticity works. If you walk down the same path forever, you end up falling into these addictive ruts. And then this is the um, current model um, that I came to uh, of the nervous system with uh, my clients. This is the client version that we made it. We made it as simple as we could. So we, we talk about these six F states in the nervous system. Um, the flock one is the grounded ventral place. And then flight fight is the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. And fold is um, Steve Porges' um, dorsal branch of the nervous system. This is what he discovered was there in the body and named as part of the autonomic nervous system. And that's new because prior to that, it wasn't included, dissociation <clears throat> and the dorsal branch was not included in the older traditional model of the autonomic nervous system. And when he named this, trauma therapists were just um, overwhelmed with um, <laughs> a kind of amazing feeling of like, wow, that makes perfect sense because we could see in our clients and I could see in these young women that I was working with that they were folding down into these numbing dissociated states to survive in environments where it wasn't safe to be present. And thank goodness that the body had the capacity to do that. The problem is that the body gets stuck in those pathways. And then we develop these really entrenched addictions so that, that's not good, you know? That's where we come in and our job uh, as, as um, working with addictions and, and as, as addicts is to really work at rewiring the brain so that we're moving out of that pathway and we'll get more to that. Then the three um, other branches here, this is the addictive branch. Uh, state. It's an intertwining or blended state, we call it, because it blends between sympathetic and the folding down of dorsal. And so we see these um, behaviors in this fixated freeze place of addiction as shifting us back and forth, right, between flight, fight, and then freezing, and then folding into collapsing and numbing and back again. And this is how we think about addictions through a polyvagal lens. There's two other blended states that um, we've identified. And uh, you know the theory is still really being developed um, through Steve and a lot of us that are working on it. So we talk about it a lot and we change it and it comes. In, um, so this blended state here is one of fun or being really fired up about something. And that's a blending of, of, of grounded, safe enough places in the body with some sympathetic flight fight uh, activation. So when you hear, you know, little kids playing in the play yard, in the, in the uh, playground, you can hear them in this kind of fun or even fired up state. And then if somebody gets hurt, they quickly shift up into the sympathetic branch to mobilize to either fight back or get out of there and go home and find a parent to, to comfort you if you're lucky enough. Um, the other uh, blended state, beautiful state of flow. This is a blending of the grounded place in the nervous system in the body and also the dorsal branch of the vagus, which is about being safe to be still and immobilized. 
And so in these states, we get our focusing practice, um, lovemaking is here, uh, meditation, uh, things, places where we can just kind of float along in the, in the, in the water and feel that it's safe to be still and nobody's going to attack us. So we look for these kinds of practices to lay down new neural pathways that replace these old addictive ones. And that's the healing journey. So here's a something so beautiful that, um, oh, wait a minute, Steve said that I really like, I wanted to read to you. When I read this from Steve Porges' pocketbook, I knew I had found the right place for, for my work. If we want individuals to feel safe, we don't accuse them of doing something wrong or bad. We explain to them how their body responded, how their responses are adaptive, how we need to appreciate this adaptive feature, and how the client needs to understand that this adaptive feature is flexible and can change in different contexts. Then we can use our wonderfully creative and integrative brain to develop a narrative that treats our atypical behaviors not as bad, but as understandable in terms of adaptive functions that may often be heroic. So you see this shift in paradigms. This is another way that we have through polyvagal theory of understanding emotional suffering that moves us out of that diagnostic and statistical manual and into understanding through the autonomic nervous system and state regulation strategies. So here's flock that we talked about, the ventral branch, the flight fight branch of the nervous system, the sympathetic, and then the dorsal vagus, that place that shuts down and dissociates that um, so frequently we see in trauma and addiction. And then the blended states of flow, the blending of ventral and dorsal, of fun, ventral and sympathetic, and fixate, dorsal and sympathetic, and shifting back and forth from one state to another. And the thing, the thing about this is that once you get this, that addictions serve to shift back and forth like this, it just all makes sense in the body. Okay, and here's a body card of this place of fixate and addicted. And we know this is a very, very tender and hard place to be. This is a really important concept in polyvagal theory that I wanted to share with you. Um, Steve Porges calls this the intervening variable. So in the traditional way of understanding um, in psychology, the, what, what it's taught in the Western world is that we have this stimulus response model, right? Something happens and we have a response. And what Steve Porges is saying is that there's a variable in between what happens and how we respond. And that variable is the body, it's the autonomic nervous system. So for example, if a stimulus occurs, like um, I'm walking down the street and somebody nudges me, it's not a huge bumping in, but they bump into me a bit. If I'm in this uh, state in the nervous system of um, ventral in flock, I'm feeling pretty good, the world's, you know, the world's my friend, whatever my response will be, oh, you know, don't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. So the story that I tell myself, Deb Dana calls this story follows state. The story I tell myself about what just happened, the stimulus, is that it was, it's something that happened and it wasn't a big deal. But if I'm walking down the street and somebody bumps a little bit into me and I'm living in fight, the story I tell myself is that guy's a real jerk and I get mad and my response shows that. So this is very important because it means that we need to understand 
what's happening in our bodies and to be able to be able to understand how we how we make meaning out of our lives. So you can see that if you're living here, this is the clinician version of the of the model, much more complex. But if you're living up here in this trauma feedback loop of flight, fight, freeze, and then folding down in this addictive feedback loop, and somebody bumps into you, your response and your story about how you're experiencing your whole life as each of the, these different things happen to us. You know, you meet somebody, you like them, you don't, whatever that is, how you make meaning out of your life from a trauma perspective is colored by anxiety and fear and rage and numbing. So it's very important for us to get that and to be able to use our awareness of where we are in our bodies to shift us down into living in this space where addictions aren't necessary in order to be able to live a good life and to experience the stories that we tell ourselves in a grounded way. And all of this really does bring what, what we call these real joyous moments of liberation for people. When we understand that addictions are the body's way of responding, of helping us when there isn't enough safety, the, bo the, the body will go into these states to try to cope. And we understand that bodies get stuck there and that there are things we can do actively to rewire those neural pathways in the brain and to heal. And somehow this is just so liberating for people. It's, it's the most powerful way that I have found to help people to heal from shame. It's just the body doing what it was designed to do to help us survive. I mean, really, how else would you survive incest? If you couldn't know, it would be impossible. And there are ways that we, these adaptive in that environment, ways that we, we facilitate that numbing. So I'm not gonna do this practice because um, I want to share more. This is an assessment tool that I created that we won't go into too much here. But for those of you who are therapists in the audience or coaches, it's an experiential assessment tool that helps us to be able to notice and work with clients through the nervous system and through the felt sense. And you can actually use it online, open it into Excel. And some people really love to share this with clients. It's a way of sort of tracing your journey of all the different kinds of therapies that you can bring into the model, because it's a generic model. It just really is how do you work with a body in trauma and addiction? And you can bring in internal family systems, you can bring in parts work, um, somatic experiencing, all kinds of different ways of working. And then this is how we, we work with clients. So I encourage my clients, they actually taught me, they started downloading the model onto their phone um, or their watch and, um, and we, they, or they orient to it. Um, and so we have these kind of daily practices where you check in and say, okay, where am I right now in my body? So right now I'm kind of fired up. Um, because I'm presenting and it's fun and it's exciting and um, I feel grounded, but I've got some sympathetic energy in there. And you just learn how to track where you are in your nervous system and then to notice what you might need to do in terms of grounding. So, you know, here's that trauma feedback loop again. And when we're in that addictive cycle, we're living up here. So we want to be able to move and shift down here more of the time. Of course, we need these states in case we're in danger. Um, but when we're not, we want to be able to use grounding practices. This is, of course, the ventral pathway, right? This is where when we feel safe enough 
to be in our bodies. And this is the addictive pathway. And then we go to what we call this three circle practice. So we use orienting to the nervous system. And then we use the three circle practice, which comes from Patrick Karen's work, uh, whom some of you will know. He's um, a 12 step uh, person who um, wrote out of the shadows, does a lot of uh, sex addiction work. I, li I really like this um, practice that he created and I integrated the nervous system into it. So in the inner circle, and I'll show you an example of this. This is an example of somebody's three circles. <clears throat> the innermost circle is the fixate place of addiction. And so we work with a harm reduction model because we're harnessing that wisdom in the body and we're gently over time giving messages and cues to the body of safety, that it's safe enough to let go of some of these addictive behaviors. And you have to work with your body. It's like talking to your body, working with your body to let go of those old pathways and come into presence in the body. So, but, but it's a very accountable model as well. So, you know, this person wanted to limit to two desserts a week, um, to not watching porn and not smoking weed. And that's what they over time committed to and put in their inner circle. And then in the middle circle, these are the um, defensive states of what gets us going into flight, fight, and, and then folding and shutting down. What are the triggers, basically, that activate these defensive responses in the nervous system when we don't feel safe? So things like um, loneliness is a huge one. Um, conflicts at work or with partners or things like racism, you know, living your life uh, in an environment that doesn't... Um, doesn't accept you. Um, things like COVID and changing COVID restrictions. These are all things that trigger us and that we have to be very aware of, right? If there, there are things like halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired in this middle circle. The outer circle are the ventral practices and the blended states of flow and um, fun. And these are things, you know, that living a good, grounded, healing, integrated, socially engaged life. So here would be your AA meetings like we're doing now. Uh, could be things like playing the piano or playing hockey or journaling. Um, your practices every day of checking in with the three circles, checking in with where you are in your autonomic nervous system. Um, focusing partnerships or sponsorships. This, this is the outer circle. And this can take, you know, this whole thing can take time to really develop, um, but it's very sacred, right? Um, it's, it's very, very important to be, to be accountable to yourself and to your, to your partner um, around how you're managing uh, these behaviors that you are wanting to shift. I also created a model for working with um, couples and with kids using the nervous system. And this is my book. And I'm going to stop share and come back to you. Well, thank you, Jen. What amazing work you've done. It's incredible and that you continue to do. I'm so grateful to have people like you around, you know, you're a treasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick.